The Story of the Bible by H. P. Mansfield Volume 1 The First Two Thousand Years of History How God's Creation Was Spoiled by Man Chapter 1 An Argument and Its Sequel Well, I don't believe it anyhow, declared Anne crossly. She was addressing a little group of friends as they wandered slowly and thoughtfully home from school, discussing among themselves the science lesson that day. It had not been a very satisfactory day. Miss Smith, the science teacher, had given a talk upon elementary biology, and had gone to some lengths to explain the theory of evolution, very vividly describing how, according to the theory, man had evolved from a piece of jellyfish over the course of millions of years. After her talk, she had called for questions from the class of thirteen-year-old girls before her, when suddenly Anne had asked, "'Don't you believe in the Bible, Miss Smith?' The question posed a difficulty for the teacher. Religious instruction followed the science lesson, and if she were to answer no, then the girls would go out twittering that the Bible is not true, and would ask awkward questions in the forthcoming lesson, citing her as an authority. If she said yes, then her science lesson would be discredited, for it had been indirectly devoted to challenging belief in God as the Creator. Wisely, she avoided the question. I am only prepared to answer questions bearing upon the subject we have discussed, she replied primly. But Anne was not to be beaten. Don't you believe that God created man, Miss Smith? she inquired. My beliefs, Anne, do not come into the category of this lesson, replied the teacher with disapproval written all over her face. She closed the question session and went on to some other feature of the lesson. But after school, the girls continued to discuss the subject and when some began to defend the theory of evolution introduced by Miss Smith, it called forth the very emphatic exclamation of Anne uttered in an extremely cross voice. Well, I don't believe it anyhow. I believe that the Bible is true, and that it says God created man. Later that evening, after the completion of the evening meal, Anne raised the question with her father. In accordance to their custom, the family had assembled to read from the Bible. A little book entitled The Bible Companion gave the sections of the day, two from the Old Testament and one from the New, and all members joined in the reading of these chapters, each completing five verses in turn. After they had finished, Mr. Phillips, Anne's father, called for questions, and Anne took the opportunity of outlining what had happened during the day. "'What does evolution mean, Daddy?' asked Joan, Anne's younger sister. "'The word is not evolution, Joan, but evolution,' replied Mr. Phillips, although it is undoubtedly an evil doctrine. "'It is man's explanation of how mankind came into existence, but it ignores the fact that God created all things.' "'Miss Smith said that science has proved it true,' said Anne, the encounter with the teacher rankling in her mind. "'It has not been proven true, Anne,' declared her father. "'Evidence shows that it is false.' Moreover, the very claims of scientists have subsequently been shown to be wrong. Evolution is only a theory, an idea which is far from being proved true. Take the Piltdown skull, for example. Did Miss Smith mention that? No, she did not. I should say not. What scientists call the Piltdown Man constitutes a few old bones which somebody found at Piltdown, Sussex, in England. They were handed to some very learned scientists, who, after examining them for days, finally concluded that they were proof that man had been in existence on the earth for millions of years. They even made plaster casts of what he was supposed to look like, and these were placed in many museums throughout the world, so that people looking at them imagined that the whole man had been found, and not merely a few pieces of bone. They gave him a very learned name, calling him Ionthropos, or Dawn Man. Learned articles were written concerning him, and books like the Encyclopedia Britannica on the shelf over there published some of them. One gentleman, Sir Arthur Keith, a very learned scientist who dogmatically asserted that the Bible is false, wrote extensively upon the subject. But a few years ago, it was discovered that the whole thing was a gigantic fraud. The bones which had been found had been doctored to look old, and had been left where some learned scientists might find them. I suppose whoever left the bones there thought it was a great joke, commented Graham, Anne's oldest brother. 
Perhaps they did, answered Mr. Phillips. But one thing is sure. Scientists no longer advance the Piltdown Man as evidence of the antiquity of the race, and many textbooks that Miss Smith previously used have had to be revised. Moreover, that is not the only occasion when scientists have been proved absolutely wrong, and indeed have been similarly and completely hoodwinked. Scientists seem silly to me, exclaimed Anne, trying to extract every ounce of comfort from the disappointment she had experienced in her encounter with Miss Smith. Not all of them, remarked Mr. Phillips. Many scientists have performed valuable services and made important discoveries that have benefited humanity, and in many directions their research has produced great good. It is only when they are found opposing the Bible that they have led others from the truth. The Bible declares, The fool hath said there is no God. Psalm 14, verse 1. And evidence shows this to be so. It does not matter to me how many letters a man may have after his name, or how learned he may claim to be, if he disputes the existence of the Creator in the face of the wonderful evidence of creation about him, that man is foolish. Why do men want to get away from the Bible? asked Peter, Anne's second brother. Because the Bible imposes restriction upon man's way of life, answered his father. If we accept the Bible as true, we are bound to obey God. But many want to evade this. They want to go their own way, without regard for what the Bible teaches them to do. Some give lip service to the Bible, accepting portions of it that agree with their ideas, but rejecting that which they do not like. Men think they are very clever, and can get away with this. But gradually the world is becoming more and more evil. Violence is widespread among the nations today, whilst crime and wrongdoing is on the increase. The reason for this is as taught in the Bible. As a man soweth, so shall he reap. Galatians 6 verse 7 The world ridicules God and His Word, and is becoming more and more evil. That is why we, as a family group, must stand aside from its ways and show respect for the Bible, reading it together every night. In such a way, I hope that we may get closer to God and closer to each other. We are happier doing this, and God is well pleased with us. Will you please turn to Malachi 3, verse 16, and read the verse for us, Graham? Graham found the place and read, They that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that fear the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord. I don't think that many of the girls at school read the Bible, remarked Anne. In fact, very few of them go to Sunday school. They think that they are too big for that. Every child going to school, college, or university is influenced by others, some of whom are far from good, remarked Mr. Phillips. As Anne has shown, even some of the lessons are wrong and designed to discredit God's word. You must all learn to accept the good and reject the evil. The Bible warns us of that. It tells us to be on our guard against evil company. It is like a chart guiding one safely through an unknown territory. Later on in life, you become more experienced, though you can never do without the chart. When your knowledge increases, you realize what a wonderful guide God has given you in His Word, and how much better off and happier you are in following its instructions. Turn with me to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Note what Paul told Timothy. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now listen to Solomon, the wisest man of his generation. He wrote, Train up a child in a way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, verse 6. I believe that the best thing that parents can do for their children is to provide them a heritage of spiritual knowledge. That is why I try to instill into your minds a reverence for the Bible, and to give you some understanding of what it teaches. The Bible declares, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. It is most important for you to do that, for when you are young you can remember much better the things you learn. Later on you will find that you become forgetful. I can still remember things that I learned when I was a child, but I have forgotten much of what I studied since. That is one reason why I am insistent that you learn the Sunday school lessons from the instructor. Though it is many years since my father made me learn them, I can still recite them, whereas many of the things I sought to retain since I unfortunately forget. 
Like the letter that Mummy asked you to post the other day, Daddy? inquired Joan innocently. Don't be silly, Joan, interjected Anne indignantly. Why can't men see God? asked Peter, ignoring the interjection of his sisters. Because of his great glory, which is so overwhelming that no man could possibly look upon it and live. We cannot bear to look directly at the sun without being harmed, and yet the sun has created glory. How could we possibly look upon uncreated glory, which is far more powerful? The Bible teaches that no man hath seen nor can see God, for he dwells in light which no man can approach unto. 1 Timothy 6.16 Can angels see him? Yes, angels are of the same nature as God. Hebrews 1 verse 7, Luke 20 verse 36, 2 Peter 1 verse 4. And therefore, as Jesus taught, can behold the face of the Father in heaven. Matthew 18 verse 10 Does the Bible reveal what God looks like? inquired Peter as his father paused. We are told that he has form and substance. Hebrews 1 verse 3 Psalm 94 verse 9, John 5 verse 37, and that man is made in his image, James 3 verse 9, replied Mr. Phillips. We learn that he is not merely a power or influence in the heavens, as some suggest, but is a personal, loving, heavenly father who has the welfare of his family in mind, and to whom his sons and daughters can turn in time of need. He is one whom we can love, confide in, and worship. There are some glorious words that describe his attributes contained in Psalm 103, verse 13 and 14. Perhaps Joan will read them for us. After a little scurrying around the books of the Old Testament, Joan found the place and read the verses. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. God as a father looks down in mercy upon his children, recognizing their weaknesses and making provision for them, commented Mr. Phillips. He must have tremendous power, exclaimed Anne. Indeed, yes, remarked her father. God has absolute power over everything. He holds the stars and planets in place by his power. He controls the earth and all that is in it. Everything that is created is made by his power, which, in the Bible, is termed his spirit. So that all things came from God. He is everywhere present by his spirit, which extends to all parts. Therefore, though he is in heaven, he can see everything that is going on everywhere. Something like a television set, inquired Peter. A television set is a very crude way of expressing it, but sufficient for the purpose, answered his father. God can see everywhere, so that nothing is hid from his eyes. Remember that when the first astronauts stepped out on the moon, they were viewed by millions of people on the earth. If man can make a wireless set that permits him to speak in Adelaide and yet be heard in Birmingham, or build a television set that enables him to sit in a room on earth and view what takes place on the moon, how much more can God do? The wonders of modern science teach us that he who created science and the laws of nature and who is perfect in all his ways is far above the limitations of man with his comparatively clumsy contrivances on earth. Well, said Anne, remembering her science teacher, I must remember some of this for tomorrow. Chapter 2. An Invitation for Discussion Next day, fortified by the talk with her father, Anne went to the defense of the Bible with a vengeance. She had thought that the other girls would have been as interested as she in the subject they had discussed so earnestly the day before. Such, however, was not the case. Most of them had forgotten it. Some just laughed at what old Smithy, as the teacher was irreverently called, had said. Others laughed at Anne, making her even more furious. She knew it would be impossible to raise the subject during the science lesson, but thought that during religious instruction she would be able to do so but in this she was disappointed. When she advanced the question as to whether evolution was true or false, she found the religious teacher as evasive as Miss Smith. Neither were prepared to make a definite statement that the Bible is true, and Anne, together with the other girls, were all dissatisfied with what they heard. Anne indeed had asked the religious instruction teacher about the story of creation, only to find that she did not believe in it. The book of Genesis says that God created the earth 6,000 years ago, Anne, she said, but that is manifestly wrong. The earth has been in existence much longer than that. 
and whilst I believe in Jesus, I do not necessarily believe all that the Bible contains. Anne had no reply to that. While she had realized that the teacher probably had different ideas concerning the teaching of the Bible from those she had heard expressed in her home, she thought she would have received more support than she did regarding the truth of the Bible itself. She felt frustrated, particularly when some of the other girls questioned her about it during recess. There were more arguments till at length Anne said, Well, what about you come along home and ask my father these questions? He will give you a satisfactory answer. The girls laughed more at that, which only made her more insistent that they should discuss the matter with her father. Finally, two of her closest friends, Sheila and Marjorie, agreed to do so. They looked forward to enjoying bathing in the ocean close to the home, and in the evening discussing the Bible with Mr. Phillips. A few nights later, therefore, saw the three friends in the library of Mr. Phillips' home, with the Bible open before them. In a shy manner, Sheila asked Anne's father why he could be so sure that the Bible is true, and he had replied, Because it is the Word of God. But how do we know that? questioned Sheila, gaining a little confidence as she began to express herself. Because it tells us so, exclaimed Mr. Phillips. Do you know, Sheila, that the Bible declares itself to be the Word of God no less than five hundred times in the first five books? And in the whole Bible we read the words, The Lord said, or the Lord spake, or similar terms, no less than twelve hundred times? Now if the Bible were not true, it would be the most evil book on earth, proclaiming no less than twelve hundred lies. We must either accept it as the word of God, or reject it altogether. Yes, Mr. Phillips, replied Sheila, her dark eyes pondering. I suppose you are right. We must accept it as true or false. I see that. But why are you so sure it is true? Could not the men who wrote the Bible have been mistaken? The men were not mistaken, Sheila. Many of them gave their lives for the things they believed and proclaimed. And men do not do that for a lie. A man would know whether the things he spake were his own words or the words of God. Furthermore, if we were to accept what you are suggesting, we would have to reject even Jesus Christ. He endorsed all of the Old Testament scriptures. Do you think it would be right to reject his teaching? No, replied Sheila slowly. And yet, Mr. Phillips, and please forgive me for saying this, there are many, many people in the world who know all you have said and yet do not believe in the Bible. I do not mind you saying that, Sheila, for I know, unfortunately, that it is only too true. But those people do not know the true meaning of the Bible. They have not studied it properly. The more a person reads and understands the message, the more he will be convinced that God is its real author. Take, for example, the wonderful testimony of prophecy. Man cannot foretell anything ahead with certainty, not even the weather. But the Bible has clearly outlined the future of nations and peoples, and history reveals that what it says is true. Let me give you one or two examples. You know that in recent years the Jews have been returning to their ancient homeland, and Israel has again been established as a nation. But do you know that the Bible predicted this thousands of years ago? No, I, I did not. Well, it is a fact. Over 2,500 years ago, God, through the prophets of Israel, proclaimed his purpose to punish the Jews because of their disobedience by driving them from their land, with the ultimate intention of regathering them back again. Perhaps Anne will read Jeremiah 30 verse 10 for us. Anne found the place and read, Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. Thank you, Anne, said her father. Jeremiah not only says that God would scatter Israel, but that he would regather them again. Have those words ever been proved true by events, Sheila? Uh, of course they have, Mr. Phillips, because the Jews are returning to the land today, and Israel has come into existence as a nation. How could Jeremiah predict all this with such certainty, Sheila? I do not suppose he could unless God were with him, remarked Sheila a little thoughtfully. That is what Jeremiah also said, declared Mr. Phillips. Notice that he says, Hear the word of the Lord. He desired everyone to understand that which he foretold came from God and was not merely his own guess. There are hundreds of predictions speaking of God's purpose to restore the Jews to their own land in the Bible. 
what we see happening in the Middle East today, is in fulfillment of those prophecies. I will give you further references thereby proving the veracity of the Bible on the same subject. I suggest that you write them down on paper and consider them later. Isaiah 11 verse 12, Jeremiah 31 verse 28, 32 verse 37, 33 verse 26, Ezekiel 36 verses 22 to 24, 37 verse 21, Zechariah 8 verse 7 and verse 13. I could, of course, give you many more, for the subject is extensively referred to throughout the Bible. What is happening to the Jews today, however, is but the beginning of God's purpose with them. The complete fulfillment of these prophecies is yet to come. But we see sufficient fulfilled even now to know that the Bible is true and therefore reliable. Would you please read Luke 21 verse 24 for us, Anne? Anne read, They shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus relating to the Jews in their city, said Mr. Phillips. Jesus declared that the Jewish people would be scattered among all nations, and their city would be trodden down of the Gentiles, until a certain time which would usher in his return to the earth. You have told us that the Jews have returned to their land, Sheila. Do you know anything about the city of Jerusalem? Yes, of course, answered Sheila. I know that back in 1967, the Jews won the Six-Day War against the Arabs and occupied the city of Jerusalem. True, responded Mr. Phillips. And that was in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Read Joel 3 verse 1 for us, Anne. Anne found this book a little more difficult to locate, but at last she discovered it hidden away between Hosea and Amos. She read, For behold, in those days, and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem... Do you want me to go on? she asked. No, replied her father. In that verse, God says that he will bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. He commenced to do the first when the Jews were invited by the British to return home in 1917. And fifty years later, he began to do the second when they occupied the city of Jerusalem. But notice that in the next verse, it speaks of all nations being gathered to Jerusalem for war, and consider that at the present time the great powers are arguing over the future of the Middle East. All this is in fulfillment of Bible prophecy, showing conclusively that God caused this book to be written, and that it is, in fact, His revelation to man. I did not realize that the Bible predicted these things so clearly, said Sheila thoughtfully. No, indeed, murmured Marjorie. The Bible is mainly prophecy, continued Mr. Phillips. Please read Deuteronomy 30, verse 3 for me, Anne. Anne turned to the beginning of the Bible and read these words. Then the Lord will turn thy captivity, and have compassion on thee, and return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God has scattered thee. Who wrote the book of Deuteronomy? asked Mr. Phillips of Anne, as she paused. Moses. And for whom did he write it? For the people of Israel. Where were they when he wrote it? They were in the wilderness, approaching the promised land. Thank you, Anne, that is true. And it means that long before the Jews were established as a nation in Palestine, nearly 3,500 years ago, Moses predicted that through disobedience they would be scattered into all parts of the earth, and later, in the latter days, they would be regathered again to their land. What other books speak so clearly about events in the future as the Bible does? I know of no other. Will you read Deuteronomy 28, verse 64 for me, please, Marjorie? Marjorie read, And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from one end of the earth even unto the other, and... Uh, That will do, thank you, Marjorie, interrupted Mr. Phillips. Now, were the Jews scattered among the nations, as it says they would be? Yes, Mr. Phillips. That being the case, Marjorie, can you tell me how Moses would know that the Jews were going to be scattered into all the earth if God had not revealed it to him. But the Jews were scattered many, many years ago, Mr. Phillips. Perhaps Moses did not predict it. How can we be sure that these words are written before the events took place? Is Moses living today, Marjorie? Of course not. But the Jews are returning to their land as he said they would in the reference that Anne read, Mr. Phillips said to Marjorie. That is true, I would forgotten that. Well then, Marjorie, how could Moses predict these things if God were not with him? 
I don't suppose that he could at all, Mr. Phillips. Moses was not the only prophet of the Bible to speak of the future of the Jewish people, continued Mr. Phillips. They all did so, in an equally wonderful language. For example, Jeremiah declared that despite the persecution that they would endure, they would never be destroyed. In chapter 31, verse 11, he proclaimed the words of Yahweh, the God of Israel, For I am with thee to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Now consider the full import of these words. Throughout the ages, evil men have arisen, and proclaimed their intention to destroy the name of the Jews from off the earth. But they have never succeeded. And God's word has proved true. Hitler, of Germany, was one such. He destroyed six million Jews in a brutal way, but out of all that persecution and the terrible war that Hitler brought upon the world, there came the Jewish state of Israel. God's promise is thus vindicated, and the Jews shown to be his witnesses. Their condition reveals that every confidence can be placed in the words of Scripture. Let me show you another example. Would you please read Isaiah 13, verses 19 to 20, and and turned to the place and read, Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. Now, Sheila and Marjorie, would you like to tell me what you know of Babylon? asked Mr. Phillips. Silence followed the question. Both girls looked at each other with a little laugh, and both admitted that they knew nothing about Babylon. If you lived in the days of Isaiah the prophet, you would know plenty about this mighty city, remarked Mr. Phillips. It was one of the oldest cities known to man, and was the capital of a mighty empire which spread over the then known world. Its greatest monarch was a man called Nebuchadnezzar, who took Daniel the prophet captive to Babylon. Under this king, the city rose to its greatest power. He caused much of it to be rebuilt, so that it became known as the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency. Herodotus, an historian who lived many years before Christ, says that it measured a square 24 kilometers each way, enclosed by walls 26 meters thick and 107 meters high. Those walls were intended to keep all enemies out and were so strong that it was thought that Babylon would last forever. It was a beautiful city of stately palaces and homes, and it included a wonderful park of hanging gardens, which the king caused to be built for his queen, so that she did not become homesick for the shrubs, trees, and flowers of her native land. The mighty river Euphrates flowed through the center of the city, adding to its beauty and providing necessary water. No city before or since has equaled it for strength and beauty. Yet God declared that this mighty city would be completely overthrown to become like Sodom and Gomorrah. I have seen the ruins of this city not far from Baghdad in Iraq. They are exactly as described by Isaiah the prophet. Yet smaller, weaker cities like Jerusalem or Damascus have withstood the ravages of time and attack and have continued down the ages as God declared they would. Isaiah's words have proven to be true to this present time. How could he speak so definitely of the destiny of such a mighty city? God must have revealed it to him, agreed the girls. That is the only possible explanation, commented Mr. Phillips. So completely was the city destroyed, though this actually took place many centuries after Isaiah wrote, that for years men did not know the site of ancient Babylon for sure. And then, a little over 150 years ago, its ruins were uncovered by archaeologists. Before then, it was but a mound of dirt. But when this was dug through, it revealed the foundations and walls of palaces, houses, and shops of Nebuchadnezzar's day. Many of the things discovered are now in the museums of the world. During the excavations, an incident occurred which proved how true are the words of Isaiah. The prophet declared that the Arabian shall not pitch his tent there, which is a strange thing to say of such a mighty and populous city. But because of superstitious dread, the Arab workmen employed by the archaeologists would not camp overnight on the site of Babylon. 
they had some strange ideas about the place that made them frightened to do so, so that they had to be taken each night to some other place to camp. Thus the words of the prophet were fulfilled to the very letter. Isaiah also says the shepherds would not make their folds there, remarked Anne. Yes, replied her father, and those words are also true. In the days of Isaiah, Babylon was a fertile place, watered by irrigation drawn from the river Euphrates. Today it is but a sandy waste. It would be no use shepherds taking their flocks there, because there would be little for them to graze upon. Pass me that book on the bottom shelf called Wonders of the Past, and I will show you a drawing of Babylon as it was in the days of the prophet, and photos of how it looks today. Anne passed the book to her father, and the three girls spent some time looking at the interesting drawings of the ancient city with its stately entrance called the Ishtar Gate and the magnificent road known as the Processional Way, along which rode the king as he returned from his many triumphs. But how different was all that pomp and glory in comparison to the graveyard of ruins that the photos revealed. After a while, Mr. Phillips interrupted them. Let me ask you another question, Sheila. You know a little about history of our times, I suppose? Yes, Mr. Phillips, history is one of my favorite subjects at school. Well, Sheila, continued Mr. Phillips with a smile, would you say that Egypt is a great nation today? N no, I would not. As a matter of fact, we had a lesson on Egypt yesterday in our studies on general knowledge, and the teacher remarked on how backward the Egyptians were. Most of the people are poor and ignorant, they have very little schooling and suffer some terrible diseases. She did tell us that conditions have been a little better in recent years, but even so the Egyptians have suffered many defeats at the hands of the Jews. Was Egypt always like that, Sheila? Oh no, the teacher explained to us that Egypt was once a very great power, it is shown by the pyramids and other ancient buildings. That is true, agreed Mr. Phillips. In fact, in old times, Egypt was perhaps the greatest of the nations and was feared by the others. Today, evidence of that greatness is to be seen in many museums of the world, and particularly in the Cairo Museum, which it has been my privilege to visit on several occasions. But today, Egypt is a backward nation and has suffered three defeats by Israel, even though the Jewish people were largely unprepared for war. In the light of all this, read Ezekiel 28 verse 15 for me, Anne. Anne read, It, that is Egypt, shall be the basest of the kingdoms, neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations, for I will diminish them, and they shall no more rule over the nations. When the prophet spoke those words, said Mr. Phillips, Egypt was known as a nation of great power, which for hundreds of years had ruled over other nations. Yet the prophet was able to predict that this would be the case no longer, and it would become a base or humbled nation. Since he spake those words, Egypt has never ruled over the nations, and instead was humbled before them. Even though today it has gained its independence, it is still in a backward condition. Many of its people live in abject poverty, and once you leave the main cities, you find that they exist in very primitive conditions. It has been the very weakness of Egypt and its constant defeats in battle that caused Mr. Sadat to seek peace with Israel. I can see now why you believe the Bible is true, said Sheila frankly. It is undoubtedly true, remarked Mr. Phillips enthusiastically. We have considered three nations, and have found that what the Bible said concerning them has come to pass. The Bible declared that the Jews would be scattered into all nations, but would not be destroyed, and that in the latter days they would be brought again to their own land. On the other hand, it declared that mighty Babylon, which took the Jews into captivity, would be so utterly destroyed that the city would become a complete waste. It foretold that Egypt would continue as a nation, but in a humbled condition, no longer ruling over other nations. Do you think that men could foretell these things without the help of God? The girls admitted that the evidence showed that God was with the prophets of Israel. Very well, continued Mr. Phillips. If those predictions are true, what of the one found in Acts 1 verse 11? Let me read it for you. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Those words were spoken to the disciples of Jesus, after they had seen him ascend into heaven. They teach that Jesus must return to this earth to fulfill therein the purpose of God. As God's words proved true regarding Israel, Babylon, and Egypt, 
so they will do so in regard to Jesus Christ. One day he shall return to the earth, as this verse predicts. Now I want you to read Daniel 2 verse 44, Anne, to show for what purpose he will return. Anne turned up the place and read, The God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That will do, Anne, interrupted Mr. Phillips. Now read Jeremiah 3 verse 17. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Now Zechariah 14 verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Now Psalm 102 verse 16. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. Thank you, Anne. Those four statements show that Jesus is to return, that he is to set up a kingdom on earth that shall never be destroyed, and which shall bring universal peace to this troubled world, that he will reign as king over all the earth from his capital, Jerusalem, and that all this will be preceded by the restoration of the people of Israel. The history of the nations show that God's word is true, and that it truly foretells what is to come to pass. Moreover, the return of the Jews in our day shows that every confidence can be placed in the Bible. In fact, it is the word of God and to be trusted. What do you think of that, Sheila? I think it has been a most interesting evening, Mr. Phillips, and I have learned a lot. Very well, girls. We will leave it there for the time being. And now, if you like, we will enjoy some music on the radiogram. Chapter 3. Creation A few days later, Anne invited her friends home to discuss the Bible with Mr. Phillips. She wanted her father to tell them about creation, particularly in view of their encounter with Miss Smith. The girls agreed to come, but found it difficult to form the questions they desired to ask. It was left to Mr. Phillips to commence. He did so by telling the girls to relax, and invited them to ask any questions as he outlined for them the story of creation. The first book of the Bible he commenced is called Genesis. It means beginning. It is a book of beginnings. It tells how God created the heaven and the earth many, many years ago, and later filled it with its inhabitants. It explains how sin first made its appearance and death followed, how God first introduced a way of salvation and made it possible for man to attain unto it. It reveals the beginnings of the nations of mankind, the beginning of the proclamation of the gospel, the beginning of the people of God. It even commences with the statement, In the beginning God made heaven and earth. Daddy, interrupted Anne suddenly as she recalled her encounter with Miss Smith, was that six thousand years ago? We do not know how long ago it was, for we are not told, replied her father. Notice that Genesis 1 verse 1 states that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and then states, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. It means that verse 1 records a period of time long before verse 2. It took place long before the creation of Adam and Eve, so long before that the record merely says, In the beginning, whenever that was. It could have been many thousands of years ago, suggested Sheila. It could have been millions of years ago for all we know, answered Mr. Phillips. Would that explain the existence of ancient fossils that Miss Smith told us about? inquired Marjorie. The actual date of fossils has never been established with certainty, replied Mr. Phillips. Authorities differ as to their antiquity. If they are as old as some scientists claim, then they date back to what we would call a pre-Adamic civilization on the earth. Was there life on earth before Adam? asked Anne. It could be possible, suggested Mr. Phillips, though the Bible does not say so specifically. Nevertheless, the antiquity of the earth is strongly implied in the Bible. Where does it do that? asked Anne. We read in Genesis 1 verse 2 that the earth was without form and void before the acts of creation referred to in the following verses. But Hebrew scholars maintain that the verb heya, where it is expressed in this sentence, should be rendered to become, to take place or some similar expression. The same verb in the same construction is found in Genesis 2 verse 7, man became a living soul. So if we read Genesis 1 verse 2, it would suggest that originally the earth was not without form and void, as indicated there, but it became so. This agrees with Isaiah 45 verse 18, which should read according to the Hebrew, he created it not a void, but to be inhabited. 
Does that mean that the earth was peopled before the creation of Genesis 1? asked Sheila. It does not specifically say that it was, commented Mr. Phillips, but it could well have been so. If the fossils of which you have been speaking are as old as scientists say, they would apply to that pre-Adamic creation. It might well be that the angels peopled the earth as mortals before this creation, and by a life of probation ultimately attained to their present state. I say this because when Adam sinned, the angel said that he had become as they, to know good and evil. What does without form and void mean? inquired Anne. The words mean waste and empty, replied her father. If there was a pre-Adamic creation, it must have been overwhelmed by some terrible catastrophe, when God's purpose with the earth had been completed. Those mortals who found approval in his sight would have been given divine nature, and, as angels, become God's ministers to reorder creation. Genesis 1 verse 26. It is the hope of those who obey God now that they might become equal unto the angels at Christ's coming. Luke 20 verse 36. I find this a rather difficult subject, Mr. Phillips, commented Marjorie, who had been puzzling over the discussion. It is rather difficult, agreed Mr. Phillips, and I only mention it because of the discussion Anne had with Miss Smith. I can assure you that there is no real conflict between the Bible and real science. But let us remember that much that passes current for science is not confirmed. The theories of scientists often challenge facts, whereas the Bible does not. The theory of evolution has never been proved, so that today many scientists are turning away from it. What scientists claimed a few years back, they deny today. But the Bible is constant and true, as we have seen from our consideration of its prophecies. In studying its pages, we need to ignore much that man declares, and concentrate upon the words of God, that we might understand His message. If the world had been overwhelmed by some terrible calamity, God must have brought order back from the chaos, said Anne thoughtfully. Yes, indeed, answered her father, and that really foreshadows what God will do with the present chaotic conditions on the earth, as far as man's rule is concerned. Consider what happened in the beginning as recorded in the chapter before us. Before man was created, the earth was just a black mass, floating in space, without form and void. If you think of the blackest night, the earth was surrounded in blackness more intense than that. Not a chink of light was to be seen, and the whole earth was but a floating mass covered by mighty oceans in which no land or life appeared. God determined to fill this empty, black, and useless abode with light and life and beauty in order that it might reflect His glory. He set His angels to work to that end. First, He caused light to shine through the darkness, thus creating the first day. Then, on the second day, he formed the atmosphere above to bring into being that which he called heaven. Thus, the heavy dark fog which previously rested upon the earth and shut out light from its surface was caused to flow majestically across the blue sky in the form of clouds. On the third day, God gathered the waters together into seas, and the dry land which appeared he called earth. Then he clothed the earth with grass and fruit and forest trees. On the fourth day, he adjusted the sun and moon in relation to the earth, so that it might experience the change of seasons essential to life upon it, and might be governed by other influences that are to our great benefit. On the fifth day, oh, wait a moment, Mr. Phillips, said Sheila, who had been listening rather intently to all this with a little frown on her face. Didn't you just say that God caused light to come on the first day? Yes, that is right. Well, if the sun was put in place on the fourth day, Where did the light come from? Well, Sheila, replied Mr. Phillips, we do not see the shining of the sun at the moment, do we? Uh, Of course not, it's night time. But we have light in this room. Did God use an electric light? Oh, I don't mean that. All I am suggesting is that if we can create light independent of the sun, how much more easily would the great creator be able to do with all his infinite power? That would be not difficult for him at all. Oh, I see. Now, on the fifth day, but now Marjorie had a question. Was the earth made before the sun, Mr. Phillips? No, I don't think so. Well, doesn't the Bible say that the sun was made on the fourth day? It it does, but the word in the Hebrew language from which our Bible has been translated, and which has been rendered made in Genesis 1 verse 16, really means appointed. 
So it is recorded in Psalm 104, verse 10, He appointed the moon for seasons. I believe that God caused the light of the sun to penetrate the fog that surrounded the earth on the first day. And on the fourth day, he completed this work by bringing the sun and moon into position where they could more directly govern and influence the earth. You know that the tides of the sea are regulated by the draw of the sun and the moon, and that the seasons are formed by the position of the earth in relation to the sun. Your science teacher would have told you that. Well, here is how it came about in the first instance. In this we see the wonderful provision of God. How terrible it would be if we had winter all the time. God so arranged the earth that we have a variation of seasons, and each in its order helps make life pleasant on the earth. Oh, I see. Well, to get back to our account of creation, on the fifth day the oceans were found swarming with life, whilst throughout the heavens there soared myriads of birds. On the sixth day the cattle, reptiles, and beasts of the earth made their appearance. But among all creation there was found no creature to reflect the glory of the Creator, and therefore the final act of creation was to be accomplished. The angels of God formed man in their image and set him over the work of creation. He became the Lord of creation, and he was given the task of governing first himself and then all forms of life. But I can see that you are bursting with another question, Marjorie. What is it? You said that the angels formed man, but in the Bible it says that God did it. Don't you think God did it? <laughs> yes, he did, but through his angels or messengers. We read that they are his ministers that perform his pleasure, that do his commandments, hearkening to the voice of his word. Psalm 103, verses 20 to 22. He is likened to a great king over them, a king who issues commands which are performed by his messengers. All they say or do is performed on his behalf, so that he really is the author of it. To give a very imperfect illustration, I might say that they act for God as the agent of a business acts for his firm. And the word angel really means messenger or agent. When Mr. Brown, who acts as a representative or agent for Messrs. Jones & Co., rings a customer on the telephone, he will say, Jones & Co. speaking. Actually, it is Mr. Brown speaking, but because he is acting as a fully accredited agent, he uses the title of Jones & Co. In a similar manner, the angels of God used the title of God when they acted as his agents, for they performed the work of God. The Bible says, No one has seen God at any time. John 1.18 Yet in other places we read that God visited the earth and spake to men of old. It is much the same as if you interviewed Mr. Brown of Messrs. Joan & Co., and in reporting your interview you said, I saw Jones & Co. today. Actually, you never saw the principal, Mr. Jones himself, only his agent, who represented Mr. Jones. And nobody has seen God who dwells in unapproachable light, but only his agents. Even mortal men have been appointed as agents in the past, so we read of Moses, who had to approach Pharaoh in the name of God, I have made thee a god unto Pharaoh. Exodus 7, verse 1. The girls opened their Bibles at Exodus 7, 1, and read the passage to which Mr. Phillips had directed them. But they found the subject difficult, and told Mr. Phillips so. Turn to 1 Corinthians 8, verses 5 and 6, he told the girls, and note carefully the words of Paul. He wrote, Though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there are gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Notice that Paul says there are gods many, and also consider he is referring to some in heaven. Those in heaven are God's messengers, and are therefore given the name of God because they represent him wherever necessary. Read Exodus 23, verses 20-21 20 to 21 for me, Anne. Anne turned up the place and read, Behold, I send an angel before thee, to keep thee in the way, and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him, and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Notice what that statement says, questioned Mr. Phillips. God declared to Moses, My name is in him. That means that the angel could act in the name of God, for God would endorse all that he did. God gave him that authority. Does that mean that wherever we read the word God in the Bible, it refers to the angels? inquired Anne. By no means, replied her father. 
It means that every passage of Scripture relating to God should be considered in the light of Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 5 and 6. That God the Father is supreme over all others, including those called God, whether in heaven or on earth. What does Paul mean when he says that there are gods many on earth? Does he refer to pagan gods only? I don't think so, answered Mr. Phillips. You will notice that the Lord Jesus told the Jews of his day that the Old Testament scriptures gave the name of God to mortal men unto whom the word of God came. John 10 verses 34 and 35. He was quoting from Psalm 82 verses 6 and 7, a passage of scripture that refers to the rulers of Israel as gods, because they were given the authority to administer the word of God as the law in Israel. Some of those rulers misused their authority and therefore were threatened with punishment. The use of the term in this place shows that mortal men can be given God's high title and represent him on earth. The call of the gospel is said to be designed to separating those who accept it as a people for his name. Acts 15 verse 14 Such people are told that they can receive the glory of God. Romans 5 verses 1 and 2 And attain unto his nature. 2 Peter 1 verse 4 And ultimately have bestowed upon them his name. Revelation 3 verse 12. That will take place at Christ's return, which will be followed by the resurrection of the dead and the bestowal of eternal life on the faithful. They will then constitute the members of God's family on earth, and as such will bear the name of their father, as Anne does my name today. However, this is a difficult subject, and one you must think upon. I notice that Anne has been taking notes, and I suggest that she give a copy to each of you other girls, and that you think upon what I have said. You can then ask further questions about this subject. In the meantime, is there anything else that you would like to know? Yes, Mr. Phillips, responded Sheila. How was man formed at the beginning? The Bible says, out of the dust of the ground. When Adam was first created, he lay there as a body without life. He was shaped like the angels, but without life. But then God caused him to breathe. His heart commenced to beat, his eyes opened. He stood up and began to walk, and talk, and think. Did he talk to himself, Mr. Phillips? inquired Sheila with a twinkle in her eyes. No, Sheila, he spoke to the angels. Was he the same as them? No, though man had a mind higher than the other creatures, and was in the shape like the angels, his nature was lower than theirs. Psalm 8 verse 5 He was made of the dust, whereas they were of God's nature and immortal. He had to be tested. He had not proved himself, and until he did so, he could not be given eternal life. It is the wonderful promise of the Bible that though we are made lower than the angels, we can attain unto equality with them. Jesus taught that those who please God and follow his ways will be raised from the dead and made equal unto the angels so that they shall never die. Luke 30 verse 26 Was Eve made at the same time as Adam? No, the Bible shows that Eve was made later. In a wonderful way, God caused a deep sleep to come on Adam, something like a surgeon will do when he has to operate on a person. While he was asleep, God, the master surgeon, performed an operation. He took out a portion of Adam from his side, and with this, still quivering with life, with all its nerves and sinews, he built a woman. That was awfully inconvenient for Adam, wasn't it? asked Sheila. There was no doubt about that, but it was the best way. Why is that? I should think that it would be better for God to have created Eve out of the dust, the same as Adam. It would have saved much pain. Well, God had a purpose in view. He wanted Adam and Eve to have everything in common, to think and feel alike, to have the same joys and hopes, to be full of love and sympathy for each other, to really be one, for they were to be husband and wife. And this was best done by creating the woman out of the man. That is why Adam said to Eve, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. The word woman means out of man. So although it caused a little inconvenience for the moment, it was the best way after all. Besides, it teaches a wonderful lesson. What is that? In the Bible, Jesus Christ is called the second Adam. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45 whilst the faithful are like unto his bride, Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8, or the second Eve, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2 and 3. 
As the first Adam had to suffer in order that Eve might be formed, so the second Adam had to suffer in order that his spiritual bride might be formed. And as the first Adam had a sympathy, love, and affection for his wife, whom he could style bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, so there is sympathy, love, and affection between Christ and his ecclesia that makes them completely one. But these are deep matters that we will not pursue now. I suppose the creation of Adam and Eve completed the work, Mr. Phillips, inquired Marjorie. Yes, we read that God looked upon all that he had made, and it was very good, and that on the seventh day he rested, Genesis 2 verse 2. It seems strange to me that God should require rest if he is all-powerful, remarked the inquiring Sheila. The word really means that he ceased his work, not that he required rest because he was tired. He had done all that he had purposed, and so he rested, or ceased from his labors. Later the seventh day was put aside as a day of rest for Israel. The people by law had to cease from their work, as God did from his, and devote the day to doing his will and thinking his thoughts. The Jews were not allowed to light any fires on the Sabbath. They were not allowed to employ any labor. They were not allowed to go on any long journey. They had to keep the day as God designed it. If that occurred on the seventh day, why do we observe it on the first day, Daddy? We do not observe the Sabbath law, Anne. We merely make use of a custom that was developed over the centuries to have our regular meeting on Sunday. The change came first after the resurrection of Jesus. The apostles were busy trying to convert the Jews to Christ on the Sabbath day when they were all assembled in the synagogues. Acts 17 verse 2. Their own meeting together had to await a more convenient time, and for this purpose they selected the first day of the week to remember Christ in the appointed way. This was quite appropriate, for it was on the first day that he had risen from the dead. But if God had commanded that we observe the Sabbath, Mr. Phillips, what right have we to alter it to the first day? asked Sheila. The first day is not the Sabbath, Sheila, nor a substitute for it. It is a day that we gather together to remember Christ. Any day would do, though this is the most appropriate. And any number of times, for he instructed his disciples, as often as ye do this. He did not set down a special day or a specific time. Well then, we should observe the Sabbath as well, Mr. Phillips, persisted Sheila, who was very keen to discover a weak chink in the armor of Anne's father. That is correct, Sheila, but not as commanded under the law of Moses. That gave man a set time to cease from his own work and praise God. But Jesus taught that the true man of God will do this every day. He will be found always striving to rest from the works of sin and observe the will of God. He will not limit it to one day, but do it from day to day. Thus for him every day is a Sabbath, or a day to be given up to God. And so the apostles taught the early believers not to think of one day above another, nor to separate the seventh day as a Sabbath but to observe the spirit of its teaching every day. To them one day in seven would not be more holy than the others, for their lives were given completely to Christ. They were like the priests in the temple, who did not set aside a special day for worship, for their lives were completely devoted to God. True Christians are in the same position. Do you think you can grasp this? Not quite, Mr. Phillips. I will have to think it over. At that stage, Anne interrupted the talk. For some time she had been wriggling impatiently in her chair, a sure sign that she wanted to say something, and now she burst out with it. Daddy, you said the Sabbath was given by Moses, but it is mentioned in the book of Genesis. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Chapter 2, verse 3. Doesn't that mean that the Sabbath law was given to Adam? That is a good question, Anne, and I am pleased you asked it. To answer it, I will ask you a series of questions. You should be able to answer them all, right? To begin with, who wrote the book of Genesis for God? Moses, I suppose. That is right. Now, for whom did he write it? For the Jewish people over whom he was the leader. Correct. Genesis forms part of the first five books of the Bible, which the Jews call the Law. What does the word Genesis mean, Anne? It means beginning. The book shows the beginnings of things. That is excellent, Anne, and really explains why reference to the Sabbath law finds its place in Genesis 2 verse 3. It was not that God was commanding Adam to observe it, 
But Moses, the writer of the book, was explaining to his Jewish readers the beginning of the law of the Sabbath, why it was ordained and given to them. I want you to read Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17 for me. Anne found the place and read the words, Wherefore the children of Israel shall observe the Sabbath throughout their generations, for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel for ever. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested. Other places in Scripture show that Moses knew nothing about the Sabbath before certain instructions were given to him by God. See Exodus 2 verse 23, for example. And we find nothing in the Bible recording any such law until we come to the book of Exodus. It is obvious, therefore, that when Moses records, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, in Genesis 2 verse 3, he was really intent upon teaching the Jews the meaning of the Sabbath law, as commanded them by God. On that day, the Jews were expected to rest from their works, the works of sin, as God rested from his. True Christians, however, will try to do this every day. Do you think you can comprehend that? I I think so, Daddy. Very well, I think we will leave it there. You have all had enough to think about for one night, and I can see Marjorie yawning, so I think you'd better get off to bed. Chapter 4 In the Garden of Delight The lengthy conversation between Mr. Phillips and the three girls had excluded Joan. She had felt a little out of place among Anne's older friends, and a little jealous that her father should give them so much time. The next day, therefore, she sought him out. As was his custom, he was strolling along the length of gleaming white sand in front of their home. Upon that beautiful beach, the waves of the ocean were gently splashing. It was a glorious day. The sun shone brightly out of a blue, cloudless sky, and was reflected in the waves of the sea, so that all nature seemed to smile. Together, Joan and her father walked along the beach for some distance, examining the pretty little shells that were found in profusion upon it, and watching the white yachts that sailed gaily along the blue ocean, dancing up and down on the waves. At last they stopped for a rest, and Joan said, "'Isn't it a lovely day, Daddy?' "'It is indeed, dear. It is so quiet and peaceful here. "'You always like to come here to walk, don't you?' Yes, it's good to get away from people sometimes, especially with all the worry and trouble and evil in the world. Why are people like that, Daddy? Didn't God make the earth good, like you said last night? Yes, he did. But then man sinned, and with sin came evil and death. Would you tell me about it, Daddy? asked Joan, remembering how she had been excluded from the conversation the night before. Very well. I'll tell you a story a story contained in the second and third chapters of Genesis, and which we can call In the Garden of Delight. It was a glorious garden planted by God, and filled with all manner of flowers and trees. No ugly weeds or prickly thistles spoiled it, and the noble rivers helped to water it. It was called the Garden of Eden, and Eden means delight, so it can be called the Garden of Delight. In this garden God placed Adam and Eve. They were given permission to enjoy its pleasures to the full, to eat the fruit of the trees, to tend its few needs, to joy in the pleasant walks and lovely sights of glorious flowers that it presented, and this they proceeded to do. But in the center of the garden were two strange trees. One was called the tree of life, and the other was called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Concerning this tree God said, Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You see, God was testing Adam and Eve. He had given them everything that was beautiful, and even the hope of eternal life if they proved obedient. Now he was trying them to see if they loved him sufficiently to obey him. And for a while all went well. Adam and Eve were not much interested in these strange trees. Moreover, they had been told that to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would bring death, and they did not want to die so they left them well alone. But in this garden of delight there was a very cunning animal to whom God had given the power of speech. This was the serpent. The Hebrew name of this animal, Nakash, sounds like the hiss of a serpent, but it also signifies to perceive, to observe. 
The serpent had listened intently to all that had gone on, and began to reason the matter in his mind. One day he met Eve on her own, and began to discuss the law of God with her. Is it really true that God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? asked the serpent. Eve replied, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, except the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden. God has said, You shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. The serpent then made a statement that must have shocked Eve for a moment. It declared, You shall not surely die. That was a contradiction of what God had said. It was a lie, and Eve knew it was a lie. But instead of rejecting it as false, she continued to think upon it. And that was where she made a mistake. For the more anyone thinks on things that are evil, the more inclined they are to try them. Eve was no exception. As she pondered what she had been told, the smooth, seductive voice of the serpent came to her again. You shall not die, Eve. God knows that if you eat, your eyes will be opened, and you will be filled with godly wisdom. There was a measure of truth in what the serpent said, and as Eve thought on it, she became possessed with a desire to eat the fruit. If it gave her such wisdom, would she not be able to escape death? She looked at the tree. The fruit was ripe and luscious, and altogether desirable. To her it looked good for food. Slowly the lust of the flesh, stimulated in her mind by the teaching of the serpent, but not by God, took possession of her. She looked again, and her mouth watered, for it was pleasant to the eyes. The lust of the eyes developed within her. She looked a third time and was tempted. Surely, she thought, such wonderful fruit will make me as wise as the serpent said it would. The pride of life was stimulated within her. As desire took possession of her, thoughts of love and loyalty to God were forgotten. No longer did she recall his warning that death would be the result of disobedience. Out went her hand, and in a moment the fruit was off the tree and in her mouth. And Adam, who came along that instant, was offered the forbidden fruit by Eve, and he accepted it. Together they ate it. And then they remembered the warning of God. They realized that they had sinned, and their conscience started to worry them. What would they say when they met the angel of God? They were like young people who, having been headstrong and gone their own way, then began to worry about the consequences. They found that eating the forbidden fruit had not brought the delightful results they thought it would. A cloud seemed to have come over the Garden of Delight, so as to spoil some of its beauty. They looked at each other and saw for the first time they were naked. This had not concerned them before, but now they felt ashamed. They plucked some fig leaves and, sewing them together, made themselves aprons. And then they heard the angel of God in the Garden of Delight. But it was no longer a garden of delight to Adam and Eve, for now their hearts were filled with a terrible fear. What was going to happen to them? Previously they had met the angel of God with joy and had enjoyed talking with him, but now they did not want to meet him at all. They decided to hide. But what is the good of hiding from one with the power of God? The voice of the angel was heard, Adam, where art thou? And Adam confessed, I am afraid, because I was naked and hid myself. Who told thee that thou wast naked? asked the angel. Then Adam confessed his sin. But he was not altogether honest. He tried to get out of it. He blamed the sin unto God and unto his wife. The woman whom thou gavest to me, she gave me of the fruit and I did eat. In the presence of the mighty power of God, the greatest heroes become cowards if they have not obeyed his will. The angel inquired of Eve why she had done this thing, and she blamed the serpent. The serpent had no one to blame. And so God passed judgment. Now that sin had entered the Garden of Delight, nothing could be done the same until it had been destroyed. God had to punish, otherwise people would sin without care. The serpent was condemned to wriggle around on the ground and swallow the dust. The woman was to be subject to her husband. The man was to labor by the sweat of his brow to obtain food until death claimed him. Even the ground was cursed, so that now it would bring forth thorns and thistles. And Adam and Eve were driven from the beautiful garden of delight, and an angel was stationed at the east of it to guard the way to the tree of life in case, as God said, 
Adam put forth his hand and take and live forever. However, the tree remained, a token to Adam and Eve of the hope of eternal life. But how were they to obtain unto that hope, seeing that sin had brought them into a state of mortality? Moreover, they were conscious of their weakness, and felt the stirring of sin within them. They felt spiritually naked, and recognized the need for a proper covering. And God proceeded to show what was required. He took from them the fig-leaf aprons they had provided for themselves, and, slaying an animal, he covered them with its skin. So their nakedness, which in the Bible is used figuratively of sin, was hidden away to teach that sin can be forgiven. The animal used for this purpose comprised the first sacrifice. It pointed forward to Jesus Christ, who is called the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, and who is the antitype of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When one comes to understand the purpose of God and is baptized into Christ, he is said to put on Christ, as Adam put on the covering that God provided him, and his sins are covered or forgiven by God. Meanwhile, the very good condition of creation had been spoiled by sin. It had aroused in Adam and Eve desires that were contrary to the will of God, and had brought them under the power of death. Their destiny was now the grave, and only through the mercy of God and by a resurrection to eternal life could they escape from the penalty of mortality that already began to work in them. That is a story with a sad ending, Daddy, remarked Joan as her father stopped. That is true, Joan, but it is not the end of the story. God gave a promise that he would provide a son to save man from sin and death, and open the way to life eternal. He told the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Thou shalt bruise his head, but he shall bruise thy heel. Genesis 3, verse 15. I don't understand what that means, Daddy. Well, let me try to explain. The serpent had said, Thou shalt not die. Was that true or false? It was false. Very well, let us say that the serpent stands for that which is false. On the other hand, Eve said, If we eat of the tree, we shall die. Was that true? Yes. Well, let us say that she stands for that which she proclaimed, which was the truth. The angel said, I will put enmity between thee, that is the serpent who stood for that which is false, and the woman who proclaimed that which was true. Between the false and the true there is no friendship. That was shown last night when Anne told us how she and the teacher had been in conflict over the teachings of the Bible. There are always those who would try to lead us into error or into bad habits. And then, if one is going to make a stand for truth or for what is right, arguments and enmity result. Do you think you understand that? Yeah, yes, I think so, Daddy. Very well. Now what happened when Adam and Eve listened to the voice of the serpent? They disobeyed God. And what did God do? He punished them, as he said he would, with death. That is true. The serpent, which reasoned matters on his own account without hearkening to God, represented fleshly people who ignore the word of God. Therefore, from the serpent originated the false teaching that Adam and Eve would not die, which led to disobedience and finally to death. Those who give themselves to those things can therefore be justly called the seed of the serpent, and he has numerous progeny in the earth. Is this too difficult for you to understand, Joan? I don't think so, Daddy. Now, we agreed that the woman had told the serpent the truth. What would have happened if she had never listened to the serpent? She would have obeyed God and not sinned, I suppose. Has there ever been anyone who has obeyed God in every way? Only Jesus Christ. Correct. And he can well be called the seed of the woman. Did Jesus die? Yes. Correct again. He died that others might live. In this he was bruised by the serpent power. But did he remain in the grave? No, Daddy, God raised him from the dead. True, and by that means he was healed from the mortal nature he had inherited from his mother, the nature that is the heritage of all descendants of Adam and Eve. He was the seed of the woman, promised by God in the first covenant of promise contained in the Bible. For God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law. Galatians 4 verse 4. 
God also warned that the serpent would bruise the seed of the woman on the heel. A bruise on the heel is not very serious. It may cause one to limp for a time, but one soon recovers from it. But a bruise on the head can be fatal, and God promised that the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent on the head. When we consider the Lord Jesus Christ, we can understand what God meant. Jesus came in our nature, a nature that is prone to sin and subject to death. But Jesus never sinned. He never gave way to temptation, but conquered it all, rendering perfect obedience unto God. Therefore, though he died, God raised him from the dead and gave him life eternal. In that way, he destroyed the serpent power of sin and death. Hebrews 2 verse 14. You said that a bruise on the head will bring death, but I had a bruise the other day, and it did not worry me at all, commented Joan. The word bruise should be rendered crush, answered her father. The word in the Hebrew signifies that. A slight bruise on the head might not be fatal, but if it were crushed, it certainly would be. On the other hand, you can have your foot cut right off and still not die. But people still sin and die, even though they believe in God said Joan, who was enjoying the walk and talk with her father. That is true, but God will forgive their sins and raise them up to eternal life if they approach him through Jesus Christ. And this is what God promised Eve. Thus, in the midst of the failure in the Garden of Delight, God gave hope to mankind. Thereafter, men who were faithful looked forward to the coming of the one who would make it possible for them to rise again to eternal life after death. Daniel 12, verse 2. They realized that they sinned and were worthy of death, but hoped and prayed for the mercy and forgiveness of God. Do you think you understand all this? It is very difficult, Daddy, but I will try. That's right, Joan. We can but try. And here comes Anne, Sheila, and Marjorie. Oh, bother, exclaimed Joan, who was enjoying the company of her father. The girls had come to bid Mr. Phillips goodbye before leaving for their homes. We have had a lovely time, Mr. Phillips, said Marjorie, and we want to thank you. I'm glad you came, replied Mr. Phillips, and I hope you enjoyed our talk on the Bible. We did very much, replied Sheila, but there is one thing you haven't explained. What is that, Sheila? How are we sure that the Bible is true, Mr. Phillips? All you have said is in the Bible, but it may be wrong. Well, replied Mr. Phillips, you must come again one weekend, and we will consider that subject also. Very well, replied the girls. That is a promise. And now we must hurry to catch our train. Goodbye. Goodbye, replied Mr. Phillips. Chapter 5 A Terrible Crime Teaching an Important Lesson The Phillips family had just completed reading Genesis 4 and Mr. Phillips, as was his custom, proceeded to recapitulate the chapter briefly, giving opportunity for his children to ask questions if they so desired. This is a most important chapter, teaching an important lesson, he declared. Both Cain and Abel were sons of Adam and Eve. Both were religious. Both sought to worship God. Moreover, both were prepared to sacrifice, for even Cain brought of the fruit of the ground as an offering for God. But Abel, in addition, brought an animal, a firstling of his flock, as a sacrifice. Just a moment, interrupted Peter, who delighted in challenging his father. Where are we told that Abel brought of the fruits of the ground? In verse 4, replied his father. I don't see it there, exclaimed Peter. It is contained in the word also. That signifies in addition, and the verse can be rendered in that way. Cain brought the results of his own labor, but Abel remembering the instructions of God to his parents, and the manner in which God had provided them with a covering, brought an animal as well. He recognized the need of bloodshedding in true worship, such as Paul states in Hebrews 9.22. Perhaps you will read it for us, Peter. Peter read, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. Abel understood that fact, commented Mr. Phillips and so God was pleased with his worship. Accordingly, he offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, and this pleased God. Hebrews 11 verse 4 What is the significance of blood shedding in a sacrifice? asked Graham. The shedding of blood brings the life of the flesh to an end, explained Mr. Phillips. 
but then in sacrifice, that blood is offered to God, and was placed on or by the altar. Therefore, as blood represents life, when the offerer slew the animal and gave its blood to God on the altar, he figuratively declared that he would put to death the demands of the flesh that are contrary to God, and give his life in dedication to the will of God. He commenced a new life before God. Turn to Leviticus 17.11 and read it for us. Graham read, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. That verse teaches that blood is a symbol of life. Normally it provides the means of sustaining the life of the flesh, but when an animal was slain, it no longer did so. Instead, the blood was given to God on the altar. In doing this, the worshipper proclaimed that he would mortify, or put to death, the desires of the flesh that are contrary to God, and instead would give his life to God in performing his will. Romans 8 verse 13, Colossians 3 verse 5. The words of Paul that you read from Hebrews 9 verse 22, therefore, mean that unless a believer is prepared to give his life to God, there would be for him no remission of sins. In other words, a believer must see in the sacrifice given on his behalf a representative of himself, and so try to render obedience to God in all ways, so that he becomes, in fact, a living sacrifice. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Though Cain was prepared to give God of the fruits of his increase, he was not prepared to sacrifice his life. Hence God was not pleased with his offering. Is there any significance in the meanings of the names Cain and Abel? asked Anne. Yes, Cain means gain. That was the one thing in life he desired. He grew up a selfish, sullen man who placed supreme value in gaining material things. Eve had thought that he was the promised seed who would crush the serpent's head. How wrong she was in that. Instead, he represented the seed of the serpent, and in the drama of this chapter, he enacted that part of the promise. What does Abel signify? asked Joan. Abel's name means vanity or empty. He was the opposite to Cain. He saw nothing of lasting value in the things of this life, and recognized the folly of the way of Cain. The things that delighted Cain were vain and empty to Abel, who put his trust in God. See Ecclesiastes 1, verses 2 and 3, and chapter 12, verse 8. Cain was a farmer, and Abel was a shepherd, observed Graham. Yes, Cain was a tiller of the soil, and therefore had his eyes turned constantly to the earth. He was of the earth earthy. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 47. Abel was a shepherd, with his eyes centered upon the distant horizon, seeking pasture for his flocks. He was a type of Christ, who likened himself to the good shepherd that cares for his sheep. Notice that both men worshipped God, but in a different way. Whereas Abel was careful to find out exactly what God required of him, Cain thought God ought to be well pleased with what he should offer. The story of Cain and Abel teaches us that God does not only desire us to worship him, but to do so in truth. John 4 verse 24. Any other form of worship is useless to him. When Cain saw his offering was rejected, whilst his brother was accepted, his true character asserted itself. The enmity which God warned would be manifested between those who stand for truth and those who stand for error became evident. Cain became sullen and vengeful. He looked at his brother with hostility and began to hate him without cause. Hence he became a murderer by intent. For no other reason than his works were evil whilst those of his brother were righteous. Even so, God tried to help him. An angel was sent to reason with him. Why are you wroth? Why is your countenance fallen? He was asked. If you do well, shall you not be accepted? But Cain was beyond such reasoning. Before you go on, have you noticed that in the margin of the Bible the word accepted is rendered as have the excellency? asked Graham. Yes, replied his father. It was an exhortation to Cain to correct his ways, that he might retain the position of eminence that he had over Abel. What was that? As firstborn, he had the right to act as priest, to represent the family to God. But to do so, he had to worship acceptably which he was not doing. What does verse 7 mean? asked Peter. It says that sin lieth at the door. 
The word rendered sin is elsewhere translated sin offering. There was a sin offering in the form of a lamb crouching at the door. All Cain had to do was to offer that to God, and his offering would be accepted. But he was not prepared to do it. He preferred to slay his brother rather than one of the animals. But God told him that if he obeyed him, he would retain the rule over Abel. But Cain was not prepared to listen. Instead, when he was talking to Abel, he slew him. Probably Abel had tried to warn him of the consequence of his action, but in vain. Argument followed, and the tragedy ensued. Unable to restrain himself, Cain resorted to murder. The angel again talked to Cain. Where is Abel, your brother? he asked. Cain claimed that he did not know. Am I my brother's keeper? he gruffly inquired. And then the angel revealed that he knew all about the crime. Your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground, he told Cain. Cain was punished. He was told that the very ground upon which he as a farmer relied, and which he had used to cover his sin, would prove more difficult to till. Moreover, he would be rejected from the worship of God, and would become a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. What does vagabond mean? asked Joan. It means a wanderer. It means that Cain would wander from place to place as the earth would not yield sufficient increase to him. Cain was appalled at the punishment. You have driven me from the place of worship and made me a fugitive in the land, so that every one that findeth me shall slay me, he lamented. That's strange, interrupted Peter. If Abel was dead, only Cain would remain. Who then would kill him? Adam and Eve had other children besides these two, declared Mr. Phillips. This is shown in the statement of Genesis 5, verse 4. Being driven from God, Cain was worried lest others of Adam's family would avenge the murder of Abel. But God gave him protection. He warned that anyone trying to kill Cain would themselves be treated as criminals. The Bible says that God set a mark upon Cain. What does that mean? asked Anne. We're not told what the mark was, replied her father but it was something that distinguished Cain, so that people, recognizing him and recalling the words of God, would not slay him. He was then driven from the presence of God into the land of Nod. How could he be driven from the presence of God, if God is everywhere present as the Sunday school book says? asked Joan. The term, the presence of God, is used for the center where God was worshipped, explained her father. Cain was expelled from such a place until he was prepared to seek forgiveness in the way God devised. But he would not do that. Where is the land of Nod? asked Peter. Mum makes mention of the land of Nod when she wants us to go to bed. <laughs> that is a different expression, said Mr. Phillips. The word Nod signifies exile. Cain was driven into exile. That is like Israel when they rejected the Lord Jesus, observed Graham. True, commented Mr. Phillips. And in Cain's attitude towards Abel, we have a type of the attitude of the Jews of Christ's day to the Lord Jesus. In Matthew 23, verse 35, the Lord set forth Cain as an illustration of the punishment Israel would suffer if the people continued to disobey God. See how closely Cain's punishment foreshadowed that of Israel. He was sent from the place of worship, driven into exile, made a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth, under threat of those who disliked him. And yet, like Israel, with a distinguishing mark, and protected by the warning of God against any who might harm him. What happened to Cain when he was driven from God? asked Joan. He was driven from the presence of God, that is, from the center where the altar had been erected, and the family of Adam and Eve worshipped. Therefore he left the precincts of the Garden of Eden, and built a city which he called Enoch. We do not know exactly where that was. That's a strange name for a city, commented Peter. Enoch means dedicated. Hence the city was a city of worship, but not according to the truth. It was a place of worship in apostasy to God, and evidently Cain made his son priest of that city of false worship. That too has its antitype in the Bible, for in Revelation 18 reference is made to a great city associated with a false kind of worship styled Babylon the Great. Therefore, in the chapter we read this evening, we have a remarkable foreshadowing of events that took place after the crucifixion of Christ. Does Lamech find his place in that foreshadowing? asked Graham. Indeed, yes. Lamech was the seventh from Adam in the line of Cain, 
and henceforth foreshadowed the attitude of men and women in these days, which are almost seven millennia from creation. Lamech was permissive, for he had two wives. His children became prominent in commerce, pleasure, and power. Jabel was the father of such as dwell in tents and of cattle. He was the father of such. He employed others to do the work. Thus he stood for profit in great multiple commercial undertakings he developed. Jubal, his second son, organized the pleasure of the times, particularly in regard to the growth of popular music. Tubalcane, his third son, became noted for the manufacture of metal goods, and especially munitions of war. He stood for power. And mention is made of Lamech's daughter, Naamah, which is quite unusual in scripture. Obviously she asserted herself so as to become dominant. She evidently stood for women's liberation. So you have a picture of things, developed out of Cain, that is remarkably like those of today. There is a false form of religion, and mighty undertakings in the field of profit, pleasure, and power, and permissiveness. And Lamech led the way in this. He claimed he did not need the protection of God, as did Cain. Let anybody wound him, and he would kill him. Thus did he boast to his wives. If Cain be avenged sevenfold, he boasted, truly Lamech shall be seventy and sevenfold. This is a significant number, for when Peter asked the Lord how often he should forgive his brother, Christ said, seventy times seven. He used the very figure used by Lamech, but in reverse. The story of Cain and Abel provides a warning. It reveals that we can be like Cain, whose name means gain, a man who saw in worldly possessions the main object of his life. Or we can be like his brother Abel, whose name means vanity, and who saw that the way of Cain provides but empty triumphs after all, that their pleasures are fleeting and soon give way to pain. Abel, therefore, sought out the way of God, knowing that this has promise of the life that now is, as well of that which is to come. 1 Timothy 4 verse 8 Cain's history is finished, and has over it the caption of failure. Abel's history is related to eternity, and bears the caption of success. Though he was murdered, he will yet rise from the grave to receive eternal life, and an abiding inheritance upon the earth. This was foreshadowed in that another son was granted to Adam and Eve to take the place of Abel. His name was Seth, which means appointed. He was appointed to the position of privilege associated with Abel. Hence in him Adam and Eve saw, in figure, the resurrection of their murdered son. So he completed the drama of Cain and Abel. Though Abel died, he did not die in vain, or as Cain died eternally. Though bruised in the heel, Abel will rise to eternal life, or as Cain will never attain unto eternal life. Eternal death will be his lot, the fate of all the seed of the serpent. We need to avoid that fate, and therefore I encourage you to read the Bible every day. The Lord Jesus declared that the days that preceded the flood prefigured the conditions that may be expected in the earth at his return, Luke 17. We see about us conditions similar to those days, and we are wise to stand aside from it all and seek the way of God in truth. Hence the importance of us reading the Bible every day. Chapter 6 How God Punished the Ungodly by a Mighty Flood The period from creation to the flood is some 1656 years, and yet all this long time is recorded in six chapters of the Bible. Another son was born to Adam and Eve, after the murder of Abel, and his name they called Seth, which means appointed. He was appointed to take the place of Abel, and this he did by worshipping God in truth, as his brother had done. The six chapters of Genesis, unfortunately, show how that the influence of the wicked descendants of Cain caused the descendants of Seth to gradually drift away from the worship of God. Evil will always overcome good unless it is attacked and destroyed. We must destroy evil habits and separate ourselves from evil company if we do not want to be affected by these things. Evil habits are like bad fruit. Just one rotten apple will affect the good fruit surrounding it until the whole case is ruined. So a few evil thoughts and bad company, if encouraged, will slowly alter our characters. 
First we begin to excuse things we know are wrong. Then we profess to see no harm in them. And finally we are found doing them. It was so in those early times before the flood. The descendants of Cain were men of power who cared nothing for the worship of God. He had not been named Gain for nothing. Though driven away from the center where God was worshipped, into the land of exile, he commenced to build up his possessions. He built a city, and as time went by and children were added to his family, he extended his power. His children followed in his footsteps. They became numerous and prosperous. They were skilled in music and the arts, and in the manufacture of brass and iron. With this, they forged weapons of war, for true to the character of their father, they were not against shedding the blood of others in order to gain their wants. They rejected the way of God, and became known as the sons of man, because they followed the way of man. The children of Seth were different. They became known as the sons of God, because they followed the way of God. For many years these two groups were as nations apart, neither mixing with the other, for their ways were completely different. Among both sections there were outstanding men. The sons of men applauded those who were skillful in business or in war. The sons of God admired those who were outstanding in righteousness. Among these there were fine leaders who educated their brethren in the ways of God and set an example for others to follow. There was Enoch, whom God especially mentions as a man of great virtue. There was Methuselah, who lived longer than any other man before or since, for he lived to the great age of 969 years. But gradually the separateness between these two groups disappeared. The sons of God looked with envy at the pleasures and possessions of the sons of men. Perhaps they were allured by the music, arts, and treasures in which the latter excelled. They probably found worldly life an exciting change. Perhaps they thought the attitude of their fathers, old men like Methuselah, was a little old-fashioned, and not up with the times. In any case, they were tested and failed. They were initially attracted by the things in which the sons of men excelled. Then they came to admire them, and finally they became close friends with the Cainites, who were in exile from God. Matters went from bad to worse. It had been God who had decreed the separation between these two classes in the first place, and who had driven Cain into the land of exile because of his wickedness. But now the sons of God were leaving the way of righteousness to go, themselves, into the land of exile. They were attracted by the fashionable appearance of some of the daughters of the men of Cain, and some of them took them for wives. And then, instead of bringing their wives over to the right way of worshipping God, their wives dragged them into the way of Cain. The enmity that God had decreed would exist between the true and the false then manifested itself. Some among the sons of God stood up to warn and rebuke their fellows, but they would not listen to them. When people are enjoying themselves, they don't like to be reminded that they are doing wrong. They try to excuse themselves, and turn with anger upon those who continue to point out the evil of their ways. This was the case in those early days. Though a few continued to worship God in truth, the majority were drawn into evil. Among the faithful sons of God, Enoch was outstanding. As the seventh from Adam in the line of Seth, he was contemporary with the ruthless and violent Lamech. But he matched Lamech's contempt for God and his laws with his righteousness and forthright preaching. He warned the world that the time of retribution was coming. As a prophet, he predicted the judgment that God would send upon the world of wickedness. Behold, he proclaimed, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude verses 14 and 15 With forthright vigor, Enoch the Dedicated proclaimed his warning message, calling upon his contemporaries to step out of the way that leads to an abiding place in the grave for the way of righteousness that promises life. He became a familiar figure to those about him, until one day he was missing. People looked for him, but he could not be found. Hebrews 11 verse 5 For God had translated him. Thus, one day his voice was raised, and people were either attracted or repelled by his message. The next day he was silent and missing. 
People asked what had become of him, and a search was instituted, but in vain. What is remarkable is the fact that he is styled the seventh from Adam, Jude verse 14, which suggests that he types those who will be living in the epoch of Christ's return. They, like Enoch, will be taken from out of the impending judgment so that their voices too will be silenced. Ecclesial halls will remain closed, and members will not attend their places of business. They will be taken to the presence of the Lord, and therefore out of the time of trouble that shall disturb the rest of mankind. Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2. As in the days of Enoch, a search will be made for them, but again in vain, for they will not be found. To impress his contemporaries with the significance of the times, Enoch called his son Methuselah. Methuselah is the oldest man who ever lived. His name signifies, When he dieth, it shall come. It is significant that he died in the very year of the flood, so that to those who heeded the message of Enoch, the death of his son would be a matter of great importance. The fifth chapter emphasizes the mortality of man by reiterating after every one of those mentioned therein, except Enoch, and he died. With monotonous regularity, this statement is made, emphasizing the helplessness of the human race in spite of the long lives then lived. Inevitably, the end waits even a Methuselah who lived 969 years. This phrase became a theme song of mortal man's existence, witnessing the need of a Redeemer. Meanwhile, the time came when God's way was hopelessly corrupted in the earth. Genesis 6, verse 12. When the glorious truths he had put before mankind were altered, and but a few remained to worship him as he desired. Those few still warned the people that they were heading for disaster, but now hardly anyone cared about such talk. Those who remained faithful looked for a leader to arise, who might help them in their struggle against evil. At last one arose, whose name was Noah, which means rest or comfort. But then the truth was almost without any true followers, for the sons of God had been overcome by the evil influence of the Cainites, as completely as Abel had been murdered by his brother. And now at last God decided to interfere for the honor of his name. Many years later the Lord Jesus referred to this time when he told his disciples, As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, verse 37. For that reason, though evil abounds today, and few listen to the voice of truth, true followers of Christ do not lose heart. They know that God is about to intervene again, this time to send His Son to set up His kingdom upon the earth, that all the righteous, from Abel onwards, might receive their reward, and true peace and joy replace the wickedness and evil so prevalent today. The Phillips family had just completed the reading of Genesis 6 and 7, and, as usual, were ready for a brief talk on the chapters. I have a picture of Noah's Ark, Daddy, remarked Joan. That would be nothing like Noah's Ark, Joan, declared Peter, always ready to pounce on his younger sisters. It must have been a big boat to hold all the animals, said Anne. True, declared Mr. Phillips. Noah's Ark was a very large vessel, of about 152 meters long and 15 meters high. It was built in three stories, with a door in the side and a window in the top. Within were rooms for men and animals, and storage for food. It must have taken a long time to build, Daddy, commented Anne. Yes, it took considerable time, and during all that long time it was there as a warning to the people of the coming calamity. Why didn't the people take any notice? asked Peter. Perhaps at first some did, but as time went on, they grew used to the warning of God and did not really believe it. They grew self-satisfied with their possessions. They had learnt many things and had come to use God's wonderful creation without any thought for Him who giveth all. They took it all for granted. They saw in their beautiful homes, their lovely parks and gardens, and their splendid cities a greater delight than in God's worship. As day followed day, and their lives were more and more devoted to pleasure without thought for God, they drifted from him. Doesn't God like people to enjoy themselves, Daddy? asked Joan. Oh, yes, he does. He has given us his creation to enjoy. But we must not grasp at these things selfishly without thought of God. True thanksgiving to him is the basis of true pleasure, and true enjoyment comes from obeying his laws, for he knows what is best for us. 
but men do not like to obey him. They prefer to go their own way, and their pleasures take on forms that bring evil to themselves and to those about them. Their enjoyment is not innocent but wicked. They are filled with selfish wants, and if they cannot get them, they will oppress others to do so. And if any resist, they will get what they want by force. That is what happened in the days of Noah. The people no longer kept God in mind. They no longer obeyed his laws. Mighty leaders called giants arose to lead the people astray, and by force they ruled over them. Henceforth the earth was filled with violence and God's way was corrupted. I was speaking to a man about this chapter, said Graham, and he declared that these giants, in verse 4, were the children of angels, the angels being the sons of God of verse 2. That is nonsense, said Mr. Phillips. Angels neither marry nor are given in marriage, as Jesus taught in Luke 20, verses 35 to 36. The term sons of God is used frequently in the Bible for mortal believers of God, for example, Deuteronomy 14, verse 1, and John 1, verse 12. The Apostle John, writing to mortal believers of his day, said, Now we are the sons of God. That's in 1 John 3, verse 2. Genesis 6 merely shows how believers in the day of Noah had drifted from the worship of God. It is interesting to learn that the word in Hebrew that is translated men in verse 2 is translated other men in Jeremiah 32, verse 20, and Psalm 73, verse 5 so that actually Genesis 6 contrasts the sons of God, that is, the mortal believers, with the daughters of other men, that is, unbelievers. That is a point worth noting in the margin of your Bible. If both the believers and unbelievers were astray from God, only Noah would remain righteous, said Anne. It doesn't say that all the believers were astray at that time, and perhaps at first there were others with Noah, remarked Graham. That is true, agreed his father. Noah would find, however, that as year followed year, fewer and fewer of his brethren took heed until he alone remained with his family to testify for God. We can understand how grieved he would be in his heart as he saw those he loved led away by the wickedness of the times, and how urgently he would strive to bring them back to the ways of God. Did he know that God was going to destroy the earth with a flood? asked Peter. If he had been told of the warning prophecies of Enoch concerning coming judgment, he would have done so, replied his father. In any case, God revealed to him his intention to destroy that wicked generation. Therefore, we can imagine how with even greater urgency he would appeal to his friends when he learned of God's intentions, and as he set about building the ark according to God's instructions. He knew that the people were doomed unless they followed him into the ark. But as year followed year, and nothing happened, and the prosperity of the people increased, they doubtless laughed him to scorn. They perhaps became bored with Noah, hearing nothing from him but his message of impending doom. They probably mocked him, treating him as a laughing stock. But at last the appointed time came, and God instructed Noah to enter the ark with the animals he had appointed, clean beasts by sevens, and unclean beasts by twos. Why were the clean beasts to be in sevens? asked Anne. They were to be used for food, and so more of them would be required, answered her father. Did Noah have to go and catch all the animals and birds, Daddy? asked Joan. No, Joan, the angels helped him in this, and caused the animals to come to the ark prior to the flood. Then Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives also entered. And then occurred a remarkable thing. Peter, can you read First Genesis 7, verse 16? Peter read, and they that went in, went in, male and female, of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. Yes, God closed the door of the ark, and shut Noah in. And shutting him in, he shut the others out. This was the divine judgment on that wicked generation. It reminds you of that parable of the ten virgins spoken by Jesus in Matthew 25, remarked Graham. The five foolish ones found the door was shut and they could not get into the marriage. Yes, agreed his father, the story of Noah can teach us lessons of Christ's second coming. We can well imagine that the people of Noah's day would feel a little alarmed seeing all this activity, with the animals and the birds entering the ark, and Noah and his family safely shut away. But the next day nothing happened, and indeed for several days nothing happened. The sun shone brightly, whilst Noah and all his animals were shut up in the huge vessel. 
No doubt the people got a great laugh out of it all. But towards the end of the week, a great change occurred. The sky became overcast. It looked dark and lowering. Great black clouds rolled over the heavens, blotting out the sight of the sun. And as the week came to an end, the people heard the rumble of thunder and saw angry lightning streak across the sky. The wind rose until it was shrieking through the trees and roaring around the homes of the people. And as they closed their doors and shivered inside, they doubtless remarked that they were in for quite a storm. But none would realize the full extent of the storm. The eighth day dawned, but the sun gave little light, for heavy clouds now obscured it. The roar of thunder rolled across the darkened heavens with an ear-splitting crash. Forked lightning darted across the sky to illuminate for a moment the gloom that enshrouded the earth. The wind had become a howling gale, bending the trees before it and threatening to unroof houses. And then came the rain. Never has there been rain like that. It thundered down on the dwellings in which the people trembled. It beat down on the forests and fields, flattening the people's gardens, pouring down without ceasing. Hour after hour it continued, all day, and then all night, and then day after day. Now perhaps the people remembered what Noah had told them. Perhaps some rushed to the ark, but God had shut the door, and not even Noah could open it. Then the people began to panic, and as the waters rose higher and higher, they fled from their homes to try and find refuge in the hills and mountains. What was the use of their beautiful possessions now? And still it rained. And then the fountains of the deep, the ocean, were broken. Huge tidal waves, probably induced by earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, swept in from the sea to engulf the land. For forty days and nights this terror continued, until the whole land was covered by water, and that wicked and godless generation of people was destroyed. Meanwhile, those in the ark were safe. Despite the wind and the huge tidal waves, the strong angels of God cared for the ark, so that it safely rode the rising waters. For five months it moved to and fro, and then we read, God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. He sent a strong wind to dry up the waters. As the waves receded, the ark came to rest upon the mountains of Ararat, no longer being borne hither and thither by the wind. After forty days, Noah opened the window of the ark and sent forth a raven and a dove to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. The raven did not return, but the dove found no place to rest, and at last, very weary, she came back to the ark, and Noah put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. Seven days later Noah sent out the dove again, and at evening she returned with an olive leaf in her mouth. Then Noah knew that the waters were receding. After another seven days, the dove was sent out again, and this time she did not return. The waters had dried up sufficiently for Noah to go forth from the ark. The angel opened the door, and Noah and his family came out, the only persons living on the face of the earth. Thus a new start was made with the human race. The first thing that faithful Noah did when he stepped from the ark was to build an altar unto God to thank him for his salvation and upon which to offer sacrifices. This pleased God who declared, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. Genesis 8 verse 21 Daddy, inquired Anne at this stage, I cannot quite understand that. Did God remove the curse that he placed on the ground when Adam sinned? No, Anne, the ground still brings forth thorns and thistles, as our garden outside only too well shows. Well, it says that God will not again curse the ground any more. Surely that must mean the curse was removed. The words really mean that God will never again curse the ground to the same extent as he did in the days of Noah. The Hebrew words rendered not again can be rendered not add to curse the earth. The statement then means that God will not add to the curse imposed at the beginning that we read of in Genesis 3 verse 19, to destroy all living thing as he had done in the days of Noah. God's purpose is to fill the earth with his glory, Numbers 14, 21, and not destroy it, although the wickedness of man causes him to punish them. How will he fill the earth with his glory? 
Can you tell me? Yes, replied Peter, by sending Jesus Christ to the earth to set up his kingdom. That's right, answered Mr. Phillips. That is God's great covenant with mankind, and the reason why the earth will never be subject to a greater punishment than the flood. And so God instructed Noah. He made a new start with him. Noah took the place of Adam. His children were to fill the earth, but God warned him against allowing them to fill the earth with violence, and told him that if any of his descendants dared to shed blood as those before the flood had done, their blood likewise should be shed. God then gave Noah a token by which he would remember the great covenant that he had established between himself and his creation. You know, of course, what it was. It was the rainbow, wasn't it? asked Joan. Yes, that is right. Why should God use a rainbow for that purpose? asked Peter. God could hardly have given a better sign, remarked Mr. Phillips. A rainbow is formed by the sun shining on falling rain. There are seven colors in a rainbow, which is the perfect number. When these seven colors are combined together, they make the pure light of the sun, which is used in the Bible as the symbol of purity. The Bible likens Jesus to the Son of Righteousness, Malachi 4 verse 1, and in terms of the faithful, a cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 12 verse 1. When these faithful ones are all gathered together, as they will be at Christ's return, there will be seen in them the reflection of their leader. Similarly, there is seen in the rainbow in the sky the reflection of the sun. Thus the rainbow shining in the sky is the sign God set before Noah and which taught him, and teaches us, that one day Jesus Christ will rule in the political heavens with his brethren, and peace will be enjoyed by all people. The flood also represents baptism, doesn't it? asked Graham. Yes, in 1 Peter 3, verses 20 and 21, the Apostle shows that the flood was a figure of baptism, so in this we have another important lesson. Noah was saved from the terrible storm by the ark that God provided. Likewise, we can be saved from the terrible trouble that is today growing in the nations by baptism into Jesus Christ. He is the ark of refuge, which alone is able to ride the storm that is coming. In fact, Noah's time is typical of our days. Perhaps Joan will read Matthew 24, verse 37 for us. Joan found the place and read, As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You see, continued Mr. Phillips, as the people were selfish and indifferent to God in Noah's day, so it is today. As violence filled the earth then, so it does now, as men prepare their terrible weapons for war. As they laughed at Noah because of his message, so many people today laugh at the teaching concerning the coming of Jesus Christ. But as the people of Noah's time were punished, so it will be with many today. Though God will not destroy all the earth as he did then, he will punish mankind to teach the people righteousness. For as Isaiah foretold, when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Isaiah 26 verse 9. Thus the lesson of Noah reaches to our times. But it's getting late. I think the girls, at least, should be off to bed. Just a moment, Dad, said Graham. Is there any significance in the raven and the dove? Yes, I believe there is, replied his father. The raven is an unclean bird, and thus a type of the Gentiles. It wandered over the troubled waters and was never seen again, for it never returned to the ark. The dove, on the other hand, was a clean bird, and became a symbol of Israel. You can see that in Psalm 74, verse 19, and Hosea 7, verse 11. It too wandered over the troubled waters, without a place to rest, until it returned to the refuge of the ark. And I believe that in recording this, God was revealing in type the future of Israel, even though there were no Jews living then. During the long centuries, Israel, like the dove, has wandered up and down the troubled sea of nations without rest and it will find none until it returns to the Ark of Refuge, as Jesus told the people 1900 years ago. When this happens, it will be the sign that true peace has come to the earth. Now, let me sum up what we read tonight. We have seen how God punished a disobedient world, how many people who believed on him were so influenced by wickedness that they drifted from him, and how, after the cleansing water of the flood had destroyed the wicked, peace came to those that remained. If Sheila were here, Daddy, she would want to know if the story is true, remarked Anne. Well, we could put her mind at rest there, declared her father, 
for in that same book we showed her the other night, there is an article showing how a notable scientist found evidences of the flood. He photographed these, and they also are to be seen in that book. Once again, the Phillips family was gathered around the Bible, discussing the Bible readings for the day. This had taken them into the time following the flood, and Peter had asked them in what way it represented baptism. Well, what is baptism? asked Mr. Phillips in reply. Complete immersion in water, said Anne. That's true, and that is one feature of the subject. The world was completely immersed in water. Now what is baptism for? It's for the remission of sins. True. And in the same way the old sinful world before the flood was destroyed, and so the new world that rose had all its sins washed away. Baptism represents death, burial, and resurrection, remarked Graham. Yes, when a person is baptized, he dies to his previous way of life. He is buried beneath the water, and when he again rises from it, he does so to a newness of life. And this is what happened at the flood. The previous generation was destroyed, and when Noah stepped from the ark, the world had made a new start. But it didn't exist like that for long. As we have read tonight, after the flood, people drifted from God once again. They are like those who are baptized and commence well, but afterwards return to their old habits of sin. From Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah, came all the peoples of the earth. From Shem came the peoples of the Middle East, principally the Israelites. From Ham came the dark races, and from Japheth came the white people of Europe. Does science support that? asked Graham. I'm not very interested in what science supports. It is a very weak read to rest upon. So often the conclusions of scientists have proved faulty by time, when the Bible has been shown to be true. It is always handy to have some supporting evidence, declared Graham. Well, I feel that we must accept the Bible in faith, and not always be running to mortal flesh to support that which the great Creator has caused to be written. The Bible is the Word of God, and as far as I am concerned, what it says is absolutely true. That might be all right for you, Dad, but it won't suit everybody, and it is helpful to be able to show that these things are supported by other evidence, said Graham. That is a matter of opinion, and I have yet to see any man convinced that the Bible is true by what you call supporting evidence. At the same time, it is a fact that science does say that the races of mankind can today be placed into three main groups. Professor Martzen, in his book The Bible Comes Alive, gives the evidence if you want to look it up. Never mind about that, interjected Anne impatiently. Tell us what happened after the flood, Daddy. At first the people were all one, believing in God and obeying his laws. But as year followed year, the instructions and teaching of God which Noah passed on to his children gradually faded from the minds of his descendants. At last a man arose who had great willpower and who began to dominate those about him. Some people came to admire him. He was what they call a successful man because he gained great power and forced others to obey him. His name was Nimrod, which means we will rebel. He rebelled against God. He set himself up as king, and by his great personality and violence he forced people to obey him. He enjoyed this power. He liked to see people bowing before him, and it was not long before he was encouraging them to worship him as a god. He was the first king after the flood. Meanwhile, all men were of one language, and they kept together as one people. They decided to build a mighty city with an extremely high tower in the center at which men could worship. So they found a plain in the land of Shinar and commenced their task. They wanted to be gathered into one place and not scattered one from another. But God defeated their purpose. He knew their wickedness. He sent an angel and confounded their language. That stopped them building, for they could not understand each other, and arguments arose as to how the city should be built, and this probably led to violence. Those who could understand each other's speech split up to form separate nations. So the building of the city was hindered, and it was called Babel, which means confusion. What was wrong with people trying to build a city instead of being scattered abroad? asked Peter. God had commanded otherwise. He told Adam to replenish the earth and subdue it, and had repeated this instruction to Noah. But the descendants of Noah refused to do it, and defied God by building their strong city. God could see this was but the beginning of their wickedness. He declared, 
This they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them. Thus he punished them for their good. Thank you.